what I'm going to speak today about is a study that we have recently done, a pilot study, on screening women at the onset of labour to assess, is this an accurate thing we can do? Can we identify women who carry Group B strep to better triage them for antibiotics during labour and to better triage their babies for septic screening after birth? So the title is Why Guess When We Can Test, which is actually stolen from a, um, parenting, a, a, a parenting group who, who advocate for screening for group B strep, group B strep within the NHS system. Um, but I think it's a, it's a very nice title and it describes what we, uh, what we ourselves wanted to do here at the Rotunda. Um, I have a number of collaborators in this work. They are all listed there, representing um, the obstetrics and gynaecology departments, paediatrics, um, and also the laboratory in microbiology. So this is the problem of group B strep. Um, and it is the most common cause of severe infection in babies less than three months of age. Um, it can be, as Richard has outlined, either early onset or late onset. And we are aspiring to eliminate both with vaccination. And as, as Richard says, this will most likely be the um, greatest change uh, in terms of group B, uh, group B strep management over the course of our careers. But vaccination, although the, they're at phase three trials, it is still a while away. And uh, there are a number of babies who are vulnerable to this in the interim. This project was focusing on early onset group B strep, so that was infection less than seven days of life, and in reality, most of these infections manifest within a day or two of birth. And they are caused by transmission from the mother to the baby at the time of birth, and that's what makes it very difficult. Um, when, a mother, when parents have a baby who's very sick, it's obviously a hugely stressful time. When they read about group B strep and they realise that the reason their baby has developed group B strep is because they themselves were carriers of this, that leaves a whole other level of um, stress for these parents um, and mothers without a doubt blame themselves. So it is incumbent upon us to try and do as much as we possibly can to minimise this problem. As I say, somewhere between 10 and 30% of women carry group B strep, either in the vagina, the gastrointestinal tract or the urethra. They're not more likely to, to carry it because they're pregnant, but obviously it causes problems or can cause problems um, during childbirth. But they're just as likely to have it outside of pregnancy. 50% of the babies of colonised mothers become colonised, but the vast majority of babies who are colonised are not sick. Up to 2% internationally develop early onset group B strep. That's somewhere between 0.4 and 0.8 per thousand babies here in the rotunda, which is about 30 to 60 babies in Ireland every year. So the quantum of disease is not huge when you look at other things that affect far more people in the population. But this does have a mortality of 5 to 10%. And obviously, as Richard has outlined, there is morbidity associated with it as well. So um, I firmly aspire to doing better for these babies. Um, and that was the impetus behind some of this work. We do know, as Richard has outlined, that intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis is highly effective at preventing early onset disease. So it's really good at preventing early onset disease, not late onset, but early onset disease. The big challenge is how do we identify women who should receive intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis? Consistently, maternity services are berated for medicalizing childbirth and um, making childbirth a much more medical experience. Um, and therefore, we don't want to give intrapartum antibiotic um, prophylaxis to every woman in pregnancy. It wouldn't be appropriate. It would impact on potentially on um, resistance issues. There can be line issues. There can be, uh, there can be anaphylaxis issues. So we can't give it to everybody, but we know it works. How do we triage who we should give it to? There are sort of two schools of thought in the US and Australia and many other countries around the world. They culture every woman. They do vaginal and rectal swabs between 35 and 37 weeks gestation and they treat all those women who screen positive with antibiotics in labour. What we do here in Ireland and also in the UK is we treat women who have risk factors. So that may be because they've previously had a baby with group B strep. They may have group B strep in their urine identified during screening antenatally. Um, they may have had ruptured membranes for more than 18 hours, or they may have a high temperature in labour. So these are the two options, but neither is perfect. The problem with screening somebody at 35 or 37 weeks 
is that screening, or the presence of group B strep can be transient. It's a dynamic bug, so it may be there at 37 weeks and not there when she comes in in labour. Or worse than that, she may be reassured at 37 weeks that she doesn't have group B strep, but actually when she's labouring, she does have group B strep. The other thing is we know that many women whose babies develop group B strep disease have none of, oops, sorry, back, have none of these risk factors that we use to triage them. When we looked at our cases here in the rotunda of babies who had early onset group B strep, there were a number of independent associations, so things that made somebody more likely to have a baby with group B strep. First-time mothers, people who weren't Irish, people who had group B strep in their urine, and people who were induced because of prolonged rupture of membranes. So they're all risk factors, but there was a whole load of people who had no identified risk factors. So as I say, triage is difficult. This um, slide just summarises the, uh, the Twitterati as such, that people who are putting a huge amount of emphasis um, on screening babies for group B strep, um, this group B strep support group are advocating that the NHS would screen everybody between 35 and 37 weeks. But I would respectfully suggest that that is a retrograde step, and we need to look not at screening people at 35 to 37 weeks, but evaluate whether we can screen them closer to the time of delivery and impact um, on their babies in that way. And this is what we studied. We studied real-time testing, screening people at the onset of labour, using this swab to take a vaginal swab and a rectal sample, sending it to the lab where it was placed into the gene expert machine and gave us a result as to whether somebody had or didn't have group B strep. As this was a pilot study, we compared it to the gold standard, which is uh, culture. Now, culture takes 36 to 48 hours to get a result on, so culture is no good for screening people at the onset of labour and, um, and uh, using that to influence your care in real time. But in the course of the study, we used it um, because it is the gold standard to compare one against the other. And the aim would be that if you can screen people, you can therefore triage them for antibiotics according to the result. This is a really busy slide which represents the algorithm of care that we use for people who have, um, whose babies are at risk of group B strep. And the aim is if we can identify the group who are, great, who are at risk with greater accuracy, we can reduce the number of babies who need evaluation for sepsis and we can reduce the number of babies that need intensive monitoring afterwards. So we were very appreciative of the funding that we received from the Friends of the Rotunda. We absolutely could not have done this work without them. It enabled us to recruit a convenient sample of 158 term patients to detect a difference of 10% with 95% power based on a presumed population prevalence within the rotunda of GBS of 10%. We included people who were term, so more than 37 weeks, who were either in labour or about to go into labour, so they may have had ruptured membranes or they may, be, may have been induced. Um, and we excluded people who had a pre-existing reason for interpartum antibiotic prophylaxis. So if they previously had a baby with group B strep, we didn't, we, they were going to get antibiotics anyway, so we didn't include them. We got informed consent because obviously this was a pilot study. We took the swabs and we analysed them. Now in the course of the study, we, didn't, we, um, we batched the results and we didn't use them to influence our care for these pregnant women. We gave their prophylactic interpartum antibiotics. We screened their babies according to the existing protocols. So for the course of the study, the results did not influence care. The population were fairly routine term population, average age of 30, BMI um, slightly above average of 26, uh, small smoking population, more than the average were having their first baby. And because this was a study recruiting people at onset or imminent labour, we had a significant enough number who were having their labour induced. In terms of their labour outcome, this population actually had quite a low cesarean section rate compared to our average, 17%, which was pretty good considering a lot of them were being induced, um, slightly above average instrumental delivery rate. In terms of antibiotics in labour, now remember these women were all managed according to the routine hospital protocol. 23 of them had antibiotics in labour. When we looked at the results of those 23 women, Actually, about only a quarter, one in four, were group B strep positive. So 23 of them had, had antibiotics in labour to prevent group B strep disease, but only a quarter of them were actually positive. When we looked at those who didn't need antibiotics in labour because of their risk factors, actually one in five of them were group B strep positive. 
We did two septic screens in these 158 women. Only one of those women actually was a carrier of group B strep. We found overall 16%, 16.5% of this study population were positive for group B strep according to PCR. And the really important thing, because this was a pilot study, was to compare it to the gold standard, which is culture. And um, this slide shows that of those who were PCR positive, there was, or of those who were culture positive, so culture is the gold standard, all of those who were culture positive um, were either PCR positive or there was an error. So it was good at picking up those people. It was good at discerning those who were actually positive. It was also good at giving you true negatives, telling you who really didn't have group B strep. Um, and this lovely graph here is an ROC graph. If you flip a coin as to whether somebody is group B strep positive or negative, you will get this line here. But when we use this study, you can see that the accuracy of the study was very high. Very high sensitivity, very high specificity. And the area under the curve was 0.98. So if the area under the curve is one, that's a perfect test. Um, so you can see this was a very, very accurate test and a very good test when compared with the gold standard, which is culture. When we looked at these babies, there were 158 babies of the 158 mothers. And happily, there was no neonatal group B strep um, in this population. So none of these babies got sick from group B strep disease. But a huge number of them were worked up. So 35 of them had a septic workup and received empiric antibiotic therapy according to our protocol. Of the 35 who were worked up, none of the mothers actually carried group B strep. And of those who didn't warrant septic workup, so the mum didn't have prolonged ruptured membranes, and she didn't have a pyrexia in labour, the baby didn't warrant um, workup, that was 123, 29 of those mothers, or almost a quarter, were group B strep positive. So really, our current triage system isn't really identifying those mothers who are group B strep positive. And this study has shown that we do have a significant degree of antenatal group B strep carriage in our antenatal population. So um, we, we based our power calculation on a 10% antenatal carriage. We actually have 16.5% in this study cohort. The study also confirms that from a diagnostic perspective, the platform, the immediate GBS screening platform, performs well in identifying carriage. So this is, I would suggest, a useful tool to triage provision of interpartum antibiotic prophylaxis as well as neonatal interventions and antibiotics. So a proposed model of care would be that you could use this to screen women for group B strep positivity early in labour. Those that are positive, you give them prophylaxis. Those that are negative, you don't. This obviously gives huge challenges in terms of resources. These are 30 to 60 babies annually each year in this country. So it is not, the burden of disease for the population is not huge, but the burden of disease for the individual affected population obviously is massive. Richard has mentioned point of care testing. Um, we have a huge problem with, with uh, the things that are expected of every single member of staff here in the Rotunda. Everybody is overburdened doing what they need to do every single day. Um, sending a whole raft of extra tests to the laboratory for them to process on every woman in early labour really is a huge extra burden. Could we bring this to the labour ward or the emergency room? It's not like there's 14 midwives sitting around the labour ward or emergency room with nothing to do who could do the point of care testing either. So it's a huge challenge to see how best we could implement it. Um, the important thing is that we, this study has enabled us to identify how it can work it has also taught us some stuff. For example, technical failure is higher with PCR than it is in culture. About 6% of the swabs didn't grow anything on PCR. And they, they couldn't be categorized as either positive or negative. But what we found in the course of this study, and certainly our laboratory colleagues were able to help us, the presence of mucus may inhibit the PCR reaction. So as the study went on, we knew to wipe the swab before it was put into the PCR cartridge. So those type of things are the kind of things we've learned which enable us to reduce the error. The other thing we're doing is looking at the serotypes of group B strep to make sure that there's no serotypes of group B strep that this system doesn't perform well for. So maybe our model of care shouldn't be that we would introduce it universally. 
maybe we should just look at the high-risk groups. For example, if a woman comes in today with a pre-labor rupture of membranes, it's her first baby, she ruptured her membranes this morning, she's got no pains. Generally, we say to her she can come back tomorrow and have her labor induced because the vast majority of people will labor themselves over the course of 24 hours. But maybe we should screen those people and see is it appropriate to give her another 24 hours or should we get going? Um, the future certainly is personalized medicine. You know, you read the Daily Telegraph, they'll talk about using your genome to influence your care. Um, and this is personalized medicine. Um, and it enables informed decision making using real-time risk factors, real-time results for our patient population. It will allow us to rationalize both maternal and neonatal antibiotic use and reduce the need for invasive neonatal interventions. Taking a septic screen from a baby involves separating the baby from the mom for an hour or so as the baby goes to the unit and has these screens done. So if we can reduce that, that's all the better. Obviously, as Richard has highlighted so eloquently, vaccination is on the horizon. We don't need to sort this out forever because hopefully vaccination will take over a lot of it. But certainly while we move towards vaccination, there will be a gap and maybe this is something we can think about. Thank you very much.